All right. Um, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm deputy director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies and director of our project on Chinese business and political economy. And I'm delighted to have all of you here this morning in person and watching online for the release of a fantastic report, Credit and Credibility Risks to China's Economic Resilience, which has been uh, conceived, uh, researched, and written by my two friends here on the stage, Dan Rosen and Logan Wright. I'm going to briefly introduce them. Uh, I'll then turn over uh, the microphone and the stage to both of them to present the findings of the report to all of you. And then uh, we're going to have a discussion. We have three commentators uh, who will join uh, the stage afterward. I'll introduce them uh, when we get to that point. Uh, and then uh, they'll offer brief comments uh, and we will then uh, open the floor to discussion with, with the rest of you. Uh, the report is now online, so you can download it and you can finish it in a couple minutes because it's really short. It's, it's only uh, that thick, so uh, I guess you need to do a little bit of speed reading. Uh, but we also have a commentary that they, they've written, uh, which will also be out in the next day or so, only 1,800 words. Uh, which uh, summarizes a lot of the co core points. But let me, let me go ahead and introduce uh, the authors. Um, uh, first, Logan Wright uh, is director of China Markets Research at the Rhodium Group. Previously, he was an analyst at Medley Global Advisors. Uh, he's uh, had his PhD in political science uh, from George Washington University. In fact, we were classmates uh, a couple years ago, or almost a couple decades ago, down in Foggy Bottom. Um, and he's uh, one of the most astute uh, analysts of Chinese finance that you'll find any place. Uh, he's also a marathon runner, and you need a marathon runner's uh, endurance and tenacity to be able to stick with following China's financial system this long. Uh, but you'll find it well worth it. Um, the other co-author of the report is Dan Rosen. Uh, who's founding partner of Rhodium Group and senior associate here in the Freeman Chair as well. Uh, Dan served on the National Economic Council in 2000, 2001. Uh, I think it's safe to say now, uh, Dan's really a pioneer in the study of China's economy. Uh, he straddles the business community and the think tank community uh, uh, as well as uh, just about anybody. He's really put a path forward for the rest of us uh, Rhodium has developed the world's most important database on Chinese outward investment, as well as the dashboard on China's economic reforms, um, and uh, is, is really a critical source for anyone who wants to understand where China's economy is going and how it connected to the rest of Asia and, and the world. Uh, Dan has built a tremendous team uh, located globally, uh, and uh, we're really honored uh, that he and Logan are part of the Freeman Chair team um, and that we can uh, bask in the glory a little bit of the report uh, that they've presented. Uh, just before, a few years ago, uh, Dan was a co-author of a report uh, Rhodium did in cooperation with CSAS on China's GDP, uh, the Broken Abacus. Um, and um, I encourage you to go see that report as well. And we are delighted to have this ongoing, long-term collaboration uh, with Dan and his colleagues. Um, so with that, let me turn the floor over to them. They'll present the report, uh, and then we'll go on with the rest of the program. So please join me in, uh, in welcoming Dan and Logan uh, to CSIS today. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Um, thanks for joining us here this morning. Um, my thanks to the Freeman Chair CSIS for their ongoing partnership with us at Rhodium in, in doing this work. Um, it's been a, a terrific collaboration over many, many years now. And um, Scott, I'll return the compliment. Um, I've learned so much from you over the past 20 years um, as well about business government dynamics in China and uh, all sorts of things that um, are foundational to how I understand how the Chinese um, economy works. Let me start the morning with you with just a little bit of levity. 
um, uh, to get going before I turn to Logan, who's going to do some pretty heavy lifting. So fat, fasten your seatbelt, um, but it's going to be um, worth, the, uh, worth the effort. So um, my Chinese name uh, is Rong Danye, uh, which means that this study can be referred to as right and wrong, <laughs> which is funny. Um, <clears throat> but it's also apropos um, because we're going to lay out an argument that it is correct, it's right, to believe that China now does face a new era of challenges in maintaining its economic growth, but that the conventional explanations for what is at work here are, by and large, not correct. China is not any longer insulated from a slowdown in its economic growth by virtue of its extraordinary savings rate. For example, um, there are, there's actually an introduction slide that can be up. Let's see here. Uh, I'm pushing the right button or the wrong button. Let's get that going first. Oh, just turn it on. Got it. Okay. Um, there we are. Yeah. Um, China is no longer insulated by some of the hypotheses that have explained its resilience in the past, for example, the high savings rate. Similarly, or relatedly, um, it is not today U.S. trade pressure that is bringing about this reckoning in the Chinese economic outlook. That's very important because it means China must change its course regardless of whether we here in Washington are being naughty or nice, which could be the next book title um, that we do after right and wrong. Um, Scott, what do you think? Um, with that bold statement, um, to get us um, rolling, let me turn to Logan, who hopefully will be able to prove us right um, in this uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and I'll be back in a few minutes um, to finish up our initial presentation with a few comments about the implications of the analysis. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Dan. So the, the symmetry in the title uh, between credit and credibility is not a, a coincidence. It's from the same root. You have essentially credit and its rapid growth has been the key source of risk within the Chinese financial system and within the economy. Credibility, we will argue, is the most important contributor to the resilience uh, of the system so far. You know, the story of, of why China might potentially face financial risks is a relatively well-known one. But the story is how China has avoided crisis so far is, is we think, the most interesting aspect uh, of this study. Because most of the conventional explanations, some of which you see up here, for China's exceptionalism are, are becoming increasingly unconvincing. But the focus on how China has avoided a crisis itself, the focus on crisis as the key dependent variable itself, is a bit misplaced. China may have a crisis or it may not. But the key implication for the United States and the rest of the world is whether or not there will be a sharp slowdown in growth resulting from that, or whether the pattern of Chinese economic expansion so far can continue. So the key argument of this study is that the conventional wisdom about the pillars of China's financial stability really need a dramatic update. You know, the fundamentals of the system have changed dramatically, and the old arguments no longer really apply. The implicit political bargain that has sustained uh, the stability of China's financial system between Beijing and the households and corporates who essentially fund it has also started to change, especially since 2016. And so those are the key threats to financial and economic stability in China rather than external pressure from the United States. Now, the story of, of why China's uh, economy may be at risk from a sudden crisis in the financial system is, is a familiar one. Uh, it starts with a record-breaking credit expansion in global and historical terms. This chart shows the rapid growth in China's financial system, measured here as bank assets, and how this fits into the global context relative to global GDP. So bank assets have quadrupled between 2008 and today. Banks added $29 trillion in new assets since 2008 alone versus only $7 trillion in GDP growth over that same interval. So Chinese banks added assets equivalent to a third of the global economy in just nine years. There is absolutely no precedent for in the last century for this type of credit expansion, which is well beyond the benefits of financial deepening or expanding access to financial services for China's population. 
We should definitely have expected China's financial system to grow, but no system has ever expanded to this size. The growth of the financial system at this stage is very important because it's occurring to, at a time when China's potential growth of the real economy is also downshifting. And so here, you know, using a growth accounting approach, the graph shows how the easy returns to growth from a rising labor force and deepening of the capital stock will produce only 3 to 5 percent growth, uh, potential growth in the future. China's future growth really depends more upon total factor productivity. Uh, which requires the financial system to prioritize lending to more productive sectors, moving credit away from you know, some of the zombie enterprises that you hear about that are simply trying to stay alive with state support. But this is also why the health of the financial system is essential to any consideration of China's long-term growth. You can't discuss China's long-term outlook without discussing the future of the financial system that will fund it, which is why it's also critical to understand that the financial system cannot keep growing at the same pace as it has in the recent past. This chart uh, places that argument in a very specific mathematical context, which shows that China cannot grow its way out of this problem of excessive credit. The chart shows the interest on existing credit, which is the blue section, within China's financial system in trillion yuan per year versus the marginal addition to China's nominal GDP in trillion yuan per year. It's not a perfect comparison, but it does highlight a key problem, that the debt burden is growing faster than China's capacity to manage it, particularly since 2012. So unless China's nominal GDP surges to 14, 15 percent, for example, uh, these conditions are very likely to persist. So China can't grow its way out uh, of this problem. This also reinforces that the business-as-usual policy approach that Beijing has taken in, in the past is impossible, something that Beijing seems to have also recognized. So here you get to the, the arguments that you typically hear about why China might avoid uh, a potential financial crisis. The case for financial instability in China is relatively well known, but more interesting to us is the opposite side. You know, why? Uh, is there anything particular to China that makes the country system more resilient in either an economic or political sense? And the first and most frequently cited argument in this respect is that China has a very high savings rate. So the argument therefore flows that China should have no problem meeting any shortfall in domestic funding uh, because savings can be reallocated from one part of the system uh, to any other part of the system that needs that funding. And as the graph shows in absolute terms, China indeed saves more than any other country at about 46 percent of GDP. But the problem is that that savings is essentially concentrated in areas that are very difficult for China to reallocate. They're concentrated within state-owned corporates, uh, private corporates that don't have access to the financial system, or wealthier households, which is kind of a, a, a consist, persistent problem. So any change in the pattern of those savings or the distribution of those savings is likely to require longer term types of policy changes. They can't be called upon to respond to uh, immediate financial stress. The other critical argument you often hear about why China's might be different is because its debt is held internally. There are no external creditors. Much of it, much of it is held by state-owned entities. So therefore, the left pocket can always move resources over to the right pocket in the case of any uh, potential financial instability. There are no external creditors to call in loans. So China essentially only owns itself, owes itself in this process. But you know, the risk of this expansion of credit doesn't necessarily change, uh, even though the debt is internal. Domestic defaults are also increasingly common. And more significantly, identifying where these domestic problems are concentrated within an increasingly complex financial system is becoming a far more difficult endeavor for Beijing. It's not that you can just print money to solve your way out of this problem. There are consequences there in terms of the trade-offs with inflation or the exchange rate that can result. The more fundamental problem with this argument, I think, though, is that Beijing has no incentive necessarily to identify and eliminate all financial risk. Financial reform actually requires the opposite. It requires some defaults being recognized 
some uncertainty in the markets in order to prevent the system from continuing to grow very rapidly. So this is not just a matter of I can identify a problem and therefore I can solve it. And the graph in this article illustrates the last point. You can't control everything. Volatility controlled in one area of the economy uh, tends to emerge elsewhere. When China started to control money market rates, for example, starting around 2015, um, you saw the shadow banking system take off. And we'll explain a little bit more about that later. But the perfect visibility and the ability to respond to every threat doesn't just elim doesn't eliminate the risk. It actually creates new risks along the way. The other argument that's often put forward about what's different about China is political in nature, that Beijing essentially has a more powerful administrative toolkit than others uh, to counter any potential financial stress. They can instruct key actors to buy and sell securities at the right time. There aren't as many legal constraints. So therefore, the argument goes that China can prevent a financial crisis from materializing because asset sales can be stopped before they impact prices. And Beijing has a very strong track record of interventions in markets uh, consistent with this behavior. You know, however, what's really notable is that the effects of these administrative interventions are, are typically quite temporary. Uh, market realities tend to reassert themselves in response. And it's far more difficult for Beijing to really control markets with multiple participants, like the equity market or the property market. And the graph here you know, shows the very short-term nature of the impact of the attempted stabilization in the equity market in 2015, um, as well as the longer-term costs in trading volumes. Prices today in that equity market intervention are still 25% 20, below where they were in 2015. On top of all of this, none of those administrative tools are really unique to China. There is absolutely nothing particular about the Chinese political system that requires you to you know, force administrative edicts um, on key market participants. So we make a different argument about a different political factor uh, in the report. And we argue that what's far more important to explain China's financial resilience has been Beijing's credibility. And we define that, and it's a very difficult concept to define, as the reasonable expectation of a meaningful and sufficient response to financial stress from China's government or government-linked institutions. Credibility can prevent asset sales and financial crises before they occur because of an expectation among the participants that market order will be restored fairly quickly. So, but more than that, credibility is not intrinsic to China's political system itself. It is the result of Beijing's very long track record of these interventions to prevent investors from facing financial losses. With the rapid growth of China's financial system, though, and a lot of the informal financial asset markets that have developed, the political bargain involved in this credibility is starting to change. Beijing has been forced, in essence, to extend its credibility into increasingly risky and peripheral asset markets within the system. And you know, one of the best demonstrations of that recently, in particular, was uh, a series of protests in Beijing in early August surrounding peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, networks. So there's absolutely no basis for you know, any investor belief in a government guarantee on these peer-to-peer -peer lending products, except for the fact that Beijing has responded similarly on a similar track record, has a similar track record of intervention um, based on their desire for political and financial stability. So this is Beijing's primary conundrum right now, and this is the, one of the key arguments made in the report. Financial reform is absolutely essential for longer-term growth, you have to reallocate credit within the system. Continuing the recent pace of credit growth is not an option, but financial reform also directly implicates Beijing's credibility in maintaining financial stability. Defaults and credit risk are inevitable. You have to tolerate some defaults and acceptable levels of risk, but you can't frighten markets so that other that think that other guarantees won't still hold. And this balancing act that Beijing is approaching is occurring in the context of a financial system that has seen very fundamental changes in recent years, particularly since 2012. And these changes are detailed in great, uh, detailed and extensively within the report itself. In the past, China's system was generally large. It was inefficient, uh, but it was stable. You know, it basically took funding uh, from households and corporates in the form of deposits, and it made loans to state-owned enterprises. Capital outflows were pretty small. Money flowed into the system from trade and investment surpluses. So even if there were bad loan problems, those were pretty easily managed. 
But the system right now bears virtually no resemblance to conditions just five years ago. The, the conventional arguments for China's economic resilience need to account for not only a much larger financial system, but a financial system with an unstable liability structure, an unstable funding structure overall. So after 2012, marginal growth was increasingly funded by, not by these stable deposits, but by short-term commercial paper type instruments, which are called wealth management products, which have to be rolled over roughly every one to six months. So as short-term interest rates rose in the competition for these wealth management products for funding, you know, banks had to seek out higher levels of return to repay those wealth management products. But there were few safe assets out there in the system to deliver those returns back to the banks. So banks had to take more risk. And they started extending credit outside of government controls to riskier borrowers and institutions. And that's reflected in the red section in the graph above, which is now correcting, which is a result of the deleveraging campaign, which we can discuss. But ba banks essentially accepted promises from these third parties in order to deliver high rates of return by investing in corporate bonds, commodities, or even stocks. You know, that all, ob all obviously sounds risky, and it was. But for a long time, you know, there was no real problem because nothing defaulted. So if third-party institutions couldn't pay, banks just borrowed more in the interbank market to cover up the potential shortfall. But all of this is changing uh, with the rise in default risk from the growth of the system itself and the extension of Beijing's credibility to these increasingly peripheral and risky asset markets. They now have to be prepared to defend against defaults in not just the loan market, but in different riskier forms uh, of the financial system. So Beijing has actually been responding to these rising risks within its financial system right now with a very aggressive deleveraging campaign. Since the end of 2016, credit growth has been cut in half, and this marks a very significant sea change, a break from past behavior. As the graph shows, the average rate of credit growth between 2007 and 2016 was about 18%. Bank asset growth right now, it's probably the best measure of credit growth out there, is only 7%. So that's essential because continuing on the current path was impossible for Beijing. So Beijing is embracing, we think, the necessity of financial reform at the potential cost of short-term stability. But there's no nuance to cutting credit growth in half. This is an entirely new pattern of credit extension within the financial system. Some borrowers will be cut off. They will have to reduce investment. They will have to reduce employment in order to repay debt. And that appears to be happening now with the greatest impact on the property sector and local government financing conditions in particular. More defaults in this system emerging are inevitable as long as credit growth is dropping so fast. So this leads to our view on how to assess the probability or likelihood of a financial crisis or a sharp slowdown in growth in China. We would argue this is far more likely when China's credibility itself is being threatened within domestic asset markets and that market expectations of these implicit guarantees and promises of restoration of market order are being reconsidered. So there are several paths to potential financial crisis, and it's difficult to argue which one is really most likely to occur. It's like uh, driving over a bridge and asking which truck is actually going to, to cause it to collapse. Um, it's very hard to predict. But these scenarios listed on the slide are, in our view, some of the more plausible pathways uh, to financial crisis. And we think that the fact that more risks are going to emerge under the deleveraging campaign makes it more likely that some episode of financial stress will take place in which Beijing's credibility is questioned. So each scenario is detailed in great, provided in great detail in the last chapter of the report. But most significantly, most of the scenarios involve domestically sourced financial instability in response to changing perceptions of government credibility, not external pressure. So you know, based on the overriding pressures that have built up within China's financial system, we can also have a reasonable idea of what policy choices China will need to make over the next uh, one to three years. You know, credit growth has to be slower as a break from its current path. And this probably suggests a weaker economy as a whole. Managing China's debt burden also requires lower interest rates in the future, at least to make the debt problem more sustainable, extended in time. Um, but at the same time, some rates for riskier borrowers also need to rise. 
you know, managing financial stress probably also involves an expansion of the central bank's balance sheet, which probably uh, over time weakens the exchange rate. Beijing is going to be forced to respond to these more pressing domestic uh, financial stresses, such as the severity of the local government debt problem, and I can go into the slide in uh, greater detail, rather than being primarily concerned about the potential external consequences of those decisions. They're far more likely to choose external adjustment rather than internal adjustment. So the latter point transitions well, I think, back to Dan and how we would relate this study to the current U.S. policy debate about China. Awesome. Logan, thank you very much. And uh, you can see that this is a pretty important effort um, that's been made here. Um, it reflects really a lifetime of work by, um, by my colleague Logan here uh, in this area. Um, and my job mostly just trying to make sure that we can um, uh, boil it down enough um, that non-financial technical specialists can put this framework to use um, and use it to better understand um, how we, uh, uh, the kind of behaviors and, and dynamics we're seeing out of, out of China presently. Um, let me just finish up with one minute or, or, or a minute and a half or so on the implications of all this for Washington, for the United States here in particular. I mean, the first point uh, I want to make, you know, we have this meta question right now of who changed, what, who, who decided to totally topple the um, enduring traditional dynamic in the U.S.-China relationship. And what the analysis suggests is that what has changed most fundamentally, and not just during the past, shall we say, 18 months to two years, um, but going back fully half a decade or more, um, is the fundamental dynamics in China's system and economic growth, and hence the sustainability of that economic growth out into the future. Um, that very much changes the, the economic um, competition uh, perspective from an American perspective, and also the strategic perspective, given how much of China's strategic presence that Scott and his colleagues here at CSIS are constantly analyzing is contingent on assumptions about what's China's potential uh, GDP growth out into the future. Secondly, of course, um, those of us who uh, are, are still um, uh, concerning them, themselves with how to find a constructive way back to a shared future with the uh, world's largest um, nation um, uh, uh, are asking, you know, what, what are we going to require to have convergence once again in our interests? And I, I would um, submit that American interests are not convergent with or compatible with a Chinese juggernaut of an economy with this much uh, systemic risk um, carrying forward in the nature of its growth going forward. So the burden of policy adjustment fundamentally really is on China to address um, these financial basics so that we can get back to convergence, which is what it's all about. We've got a lot of adjustment to do on our side, especially tactically, in my opinion. Um, but really, the fundamental insight here is not just conjectures over how to think about tactical matters presently, but rather to understand the fundamentals um, better. Thirdly, that China was truly exceptional in the nature of its growth and its, uh, uh, its, its significance for the world economy until recently. And it has now become normal. <laughs> the same concerns about whether this time can be different and whether a country can grow to the sky, um, that China seemed to be able to uh, uh, somehow insulate it from, itself from in the past, no longer can be avoided. And things are going to be a lot more normal and kind of standard um, in the outlook from, from here on out. Nextly, that the economic risks associated with China are as much on the downside, consequences for the world economy, should China have an unstable uh, resolution of these problems, um, rather than just thinking about what we could miss out on uh, if we don't um, accommodate China's interest in carrying its growth forward into the future. And by the way, that's certainly not just an American consideration, but it's similar for everyone else in the OECD and, and most of the emerging markets as well that are planning based on an assumption of Chinese demand continuing to be there in the future, growing at uh, the rate they were in the past. Um, China will need to concern itself with bolstering inflows into its system. And that's going to require, you know, a different mindset um, when it's not just a given that everybody's going to bring it to you 
you really have to think about how you message to the world economy um, and your partners out there somewhat differently. And finally, that as much as I said a second ago, that fundamentally we have very aligned concerns and interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis China within the OECD economies, this is such a complicated uh, interpretation framework to, 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 to try to manage that it's definitely not going to lead to complete consensus tomorrow afternoon around how to understand China and what's happening. It's going to take uh, a lot of work, a lot of additional analysis and conversation to truly build a um, uh, sort of, you know, co coalescence around a point of view within the OECD economies, let alone with all uh, the uh, Belt and Road and other economies uh, around the world trying to understand um, where China's headed. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being here uh, and listening to us put this thesis on the table. Super excited to, uh, to discuss it, Scott, with uh, our fellow panelists and with you. Thank you. Uh, well, Logan and Dan, thank you so much uh, for uh, the report, for the uh, very clear presentation uh, that really boiled things down to uh, the fundamentals of, of what's going on in China's financial system and the, the challenges to uh, credibility that the, the Chinese uh, need to tackle and that the rest of the world needs to respond to. Um, we're now going to turn to the next stage of the, of the program, which is uh, commentary. We have the A team not only write the report, we have the A team here as commentators. Uh, let me introduce them and uh, turn things over to, over to them. Um, the first uh, is Tom Orlick, uh, who is chief economist for Bloomberg Economics. Uh, Tom is author of Understanding China's Economic Indicators, a guide to China's economic data. As one would expect as a chief economist, uh, Tom is a data hound, uh, and uh, almost as much as uh, Dan and Logan. Uh, and uh, his, the book, super insightful, a good a parallel partner book to Broken Abacus as well, because both of them look at, at issues related to GDP. Uh, Tom served, lived in many years, for many years in Beijing, uh, just moved to Washington recently. And uh, we're delighted that he's now on this side of the Pacific, uh, providing uh, guidance for, for all of us here. Uh, Stephanie Siegel is Deputy Director of the Simon Chair in Political Economy. Uh, she was formerly co-director of the East Asia Office at the Treasury Department, and she also was a senior economist at the IMF. And we're delighted that she could uh, offer her insights today into the report. And then finally, we'll hear from Marcus Rodlauer, who is Deputy Director of the Asia Pacific Department at the IMF. He oversees the Fund's China team, which means monitoring China's economy, uh, participating, overseeing the annual Article IV consultations and report, and carrying out a wealth of other research uh, related to China and uh, the region. And we're really uh, grateful that he also can lend his insights uh, to understanding uh, China's financial system and the report. Um, I've just asked them to share seven to nine minutes of their views about the report. We did not script uh, what they would focus on or divide labor or anything like that. Uh, I didn't give them the answers in advance or, or anything. Uh, really just want to hear their own heartfelt reactions to the report and to these problems uh, and to the solutions and pathways forward. So first we'll turn to Tom, and then Stephanie, and then Marcus. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Scott. Um, thank you, uh, Logan and Dan, for an excellent report, uh, and thanks to CSIS for, for putting this event on. Um, this is an excellent report. Um, I was so excited about it uh, that I printed a copy off, um, and then I arrived here and found that there were nicely bound copies uh, already made. Uh, which demonstrates that overcapacity uh, is not just a problem uh, in the Chinese economy. Um, uh, I also, b before I jump in, I just want to say uh, a quick word about the, the debt of gratitude I owe in particular to, to Logan. Um, when, I, when I moved to China in 2007, 
Uh, Logan was one of the first people I met. Um, and uh, at the time, he was working for Stone and McCarthy Research Associates. And when he moved on to better things, uh, he was kind enough to recommend me for the Stone and McCarthy job, um, which I, they made a huge error and I got the job. Um, and then Logan gave me the Stone and McCarthy laptop. Um, and on the Stone and McCarthy laptop was all of Logan's spreadsheets. Um, and on his spreadsheets were his models for understanding China's economy. Um, and it was by going through those spreadsheets and trying to sort of work out uh, how Logan thought about things that I first started to grapple with uh, some of the complexities uh, in China. Uh, and now I find uh, 10 years on, that I still have a lot to learn uh, from Logan uh, and from Dan. Um, so um, now, um, a couple of reflections which jumped out at me from the, from the presentation. Um, Firstly, um, the, the point you made about um, it, the interest burden now exceeding the increase in nominal GDP, um, I think that's a critical insight. Um, and the, the fact that it, it jibes with the moment when the, uh, the shadow banking sector started to take off, uh, I think is also important to note. Um, one sort of um, uh, additional remark I have on that based on some of our own analysis um, one of the things that we do uh, using the, the Bloomberg terminal uh, is try and draw on data on listed companies uh, to form a kind of bottom-up view uh, of China's economy to complement the macro numbers. Uh, so one of the things we've done is we looked at the interest burden um, for listed companies. Um, and one of the somewhat surprising things we found is that there are very, there are very few listed companies that are actually paying interest at or above the benchmark rate. Very many listed companies in China are actually facing an, an effective interest rate, which is two, three, four percent, um, which goes to the way the financial system is already trying to accommodate a very high degree uh, of financial stress. Um, the second thing I wanted to, to mention, which also jumped out from, the remark, from Logan's remarks, um, was um, uh, was the point about how it is more difficult for the Chinese uh, in all of their wisdom and with all of their policy instruments to control the system which is diverse and with multiple participants. Um, and we saw that very clearly uh, in the equity market crisis in 2015. Um, and I think if we, when we think about the Chinese financial system today, we're, it's a story about diversification, right? It's a story about there being more actors. Um, and that in itself, just to echo the point made by Logan and Dan, um, makes it more difficult for the Chinese to exercise effective control. Um, so I find myself, as ever, in you know, broad agreement with, uh, with Dan and Logan, um, but it would be very boring for everyone if we all just sat around and congratulated and agreed with each other. Um, uh, so before handing to Stephanie, I just wanted to, to flag a few points, which I think maybe point to uh, some reasons for a little bit of um, a, a reason for sort of more cautious optimism uh, that the credibility uh, of China's policymakers might persist a little bit longer. Um, so the first one is, uh, and this is obvious, but it's worth saying, China's policymakers have recognized the problem. Um, Go back to the US in 2006, 2007. Do you find George Bush or Ben Bernanke giving speeches about subprime mortgages and mortgage-backed securities and the risk of a financial crisis? No, you don't. This was not high on the political agenda. In China, Xi Jinping has made deleveraging the top of the political agenda. Um, does that mean they're going to be able to deal with the problem no, not necessarily, but they've taken that necessary first step. Um, second point I would make is that um, China's financial regulation has shifted in the last couple of years um, in a way which I think significantly increases its effectiveness. Um, Logan uh, rightly highlights the buildup in wealth management products and shadow loans as key symptoms of problems in China's financial system. 
Well, in the last couple of years, the, the People's Bank of China have introduced the macro prudential assessment, um, which gives them a, a rigorous, high frequency insight into banks' balance sheets. They can punish banks which are taking too many risks on their assets and liabilities. And as a consequence, we've seen a sharp slowdown in growth in wealth management products um, and in shadow loan investments. Um, the third point I would make, and I think this goes to the credibility issue for China's policymakers, is um, China's policymakers have a remarkable capacity to move the macro aggregates in a way which doesn't solve debt problems um, but relieves stress. Uh, and the two particular examples I think of are supply side reform and slum, slum clearance. On supply side reform, the government moved very aggressively to close excess capacity in old line industries and at the same time ran a significant infrastructure stimulus to boost demand for old line industries. And as a result, prices and profits rose and it became easier for those steel mills and those coal mines to repay their debts. Um, and on slum clearance, we actually see something similar happening. The government financing a massive program of slum clearance compensating slum residents with money to move into um, new apartments. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we saw profits for real estate developers coming back and land sales for local government coming back. Uh, and real estate developers and local governments uh, are two of the highest stress parts of China's economy. And so the slum clearance program um, made it a little bit easier for them to repay their borrowing. Um, so. Just to reiterate, I find myself, you know, once again awed by the, the complexity, the, by the comprehensiveness and insight in the report, uh, in broad agreement with the main points. Uh, but I would highlight those uh, those issues, those uh, those re those reasons, perhaps for a little bit more optimism. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to Stephanie. Um, so thanks, first off, to Scott for the invitation. I have to say. Um, upon hearing who else was going to be on the panel. When I was in the U.S. Treasury working on China, um, this collection of people is precisely the ones that we would invite in all the time when we wanted to get smarter on China. So um, to be included in this group is indeed a compliment and a little bit daunting. Um, I'd like to give just a compliment both to Dan and Logan on the quality of the report, the comprehensiveness of the report. And I think it's recommended reading for anybody that's trying to figure out what's going on in China, but I would even recommend that more broadly because I think if, you know, if we think of the defining relationship for the global economy right now is between the U.S. and China, and everyone here is aware of the tensions in that relationship, I think it's really essential to understand what's happening domestically in China. So I, I hope the audience for this report goes well beyond kind of the typical China watchers. Um, Scott had asked us before to comment maybe on some of the additionality in this report. What's the new contribution here? I think there are many things that are new um, in the way of analysis. I think connecting the dots over the years is certainly something that, um, that is new and actually helps uh, really frame the, the policy issues that hopefully policymakers are going to be trying to address. And I think they were very brave in going through the scenarios for a crisis. I mean, this is something, um, when I first came to Treasury and started working on China, I came from an emerging markets background, and you look at the numbers and you think, oh, this, this doesn't make sense. And the answer back was, you know, be careful, because a lot of folks have lost money and reputations on betting that China will not find a way through. So um, it's, it is a bold move to kind of at least lay out what possible crisis scenarios might be. Um, and I think it's just instructive to kind of go through those and, and look at the different considerations. And, and they've done that helpfully in the report. Um, my reaction to the report, and I will say as a former Treasury and, um, and IMF, employee, I do have, I guess, a bias or a lens through which I view all things China. Um, it's very much through kind of this external sector and excess imbalances lens. And I think that's a piece of the financial sector story. Um, and it certainly is a piece that plays into how the US views China now. Um, everyone knows that historically, China did have very large external surpluses. 
Um, that's manifest as large current account surplus, which is another way of saying that China just had excess savings. And that savings was intermediated through the financial sector. And that was one of the things that actually fueled credit growth. Um, but that is an old story. And I think it's only a piece of the story. And that's something that is very clear in the report. It's just a piece of the story. I think a more fundamental part of the story, which they go into, is this idea of financial repression. And you define in the report financial repression as taking advantage of trap savings to extract cheap or below market loans. Um, that is really foundational to the China story. And as Tom just mentioned, it's foundational even today. If you look, as he mentioned, the analysis of an effective interest rate for publicly traded companies play, paying effectively below market interest rates, it's really foundational to the story. Another point that comes out in the report that this financial repression is actually one that leaves the system less vulnerable to crisis. So in one sense, you could say, well, this is, this is working. There's, um, there is a, a system that is relatively protected. The problem is, um, and Logan got into this in his presentation, there's a cost to that. The cost is that you have an economy that is less dynamic. Um, you pay the price in terms of lower rates of growth, you pay the price in terms of lower rates of innovation, and you pay the price in terms of economic dynamism. And that's what really runs right up against what the Chinese themselves have articulated as their goal, which is to be a global leader. Those two things are inconsistent. And so then you need to reform that system. And as others have pointed out here, that's precisely what China has attempted to do but it's, it's difficult. And I don't think China is alone in reforming a financial system being very difficult, because I don't think there's any way around it. The, in the short term, there are growth implications to reforming that financial system. Um, I would argue, but I'm curious to hear your reaction to this, I would argue the perception is because of the political system in China and because you have a single decision maker, that it should be easier to reform that system because you should say it and it should happen. I think it's more complicated because the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party and of President Xi is predicated on continuing to deliver growth and improved living standards. And so the fear of making progress on these essential reforms is that you basically undermine the whole system. So I think what we're really talking about here is not necessarily just economic and financial vulnerabilities. We quickly get to the political vulnerabilities. And that, to me, really seems kind of essential to this whole, whole discussion. Um, I'll just end on, on uh, a comment on how they actually end the report, which is um, what this means for the US-China relationship. And I actually, I should have added, I think that is one of the other big contributions of this report, because the analysis is great, but it's, um, it's putting the framework to use, as Dan said. I think that's really essential. And I think some of the questions are whether or not the situation in China is fully appreciated by policymakers in DC. I think that's a question. Um, I think it's also, um, depending on that answer to the question, um, how do policymakers, not just in the US, but at the IMF, how do they see the potential for spillovers? Mm -hmm. So if this were just a question of a bilateral relationship and the US hits China and China hits the US back, what's the impact on those two economies? That would be one thing, um, but it's not simply that. This is happening in a global context and whatever ends up happening in China undoubtedly is going to have global um, repercussions. So um, I would welcome any comments actually from you both on that, even though that's not a focus of the report. Um, thanks. And I'll pass to Marcus for that. Thank you. Um, thanks also again to Scott and to CCSIS for inviting us, organizing this event. Um, it's a great the book. We really uh, are privileged to have gotten a first glance at it. When you have to do comments, generally, you know, you have to read the book. Uh, so uh, in this case, however, to be honest, I really find it, it, it's an un unbelievable accomplishment how uh, 
very complex technical matters have been expressed in, 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 in very good writing. It was very easy to go through paragraphs and go from page to page. So uh, I, I commend you for that. It was, it was a good read, really, and I enjoyed it. So my comments, I would like to focus it on three areas. One is the role and nature of credibility. Uh, the possible triggers of a disruption of this cred credibility, and then Lenin's old question, what needs to be done? Um, first, on credibility. So um, a key thesis of the book is that it's the credibility of the government that has prevented a crisis. And credibility is defined in, na in a narrow sense as the ability of the government to, um, to, to raise a meaningful response to financial stress and that it has built over, over time this credibility by doing this, and that the sort of peripheral arguments of high national savings, domestic, uh, domestically held debt, uh, large administrative control, these are sort of not really that I important in this context. Um, the authors also make the point that actually now fixing the problems might undermine the credibility and therefore uh, be sort of an, a, a problem of inconsistency that, that is going to be very hard to resolve. So let me just say a lot of this analysis is correct. And, uh, you know, again, I've learned a lot, even having looked at these things now for, for, for seven years in great detail. Uh, there's a lot, especially as you, uh, Stefan, said, putting, pulling the dots together, and you know, it makes a very coherent uh, picture. But I would like to offer a somewhat more uh, broader view of credibility, because that then also relates to what needs to be done. You know, there are, three, there are two aspects, really, the macro underpinnings of credibility and the policy aspects of credibility. On the macro side, uh, government credibility, in my view, as implied indeed in the word itself, which has the word credit, rests importantly and foremost on the government's credit. That is the strength of its fiscal balance sheet. And this still is very strong in China, even though it is eroding gradually and maybe even faster than the government itself cares to admit. But, but the government's balance sheet, as I said, is very strong. They own a lot of assets. They own all the land. Um, uh, so their, their assets versus the, 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 the public debt, even on an augmented, uh, all-encompassing part, is, is very favorable still. Second, uh, still macro, the link to high domestic savings they also sort of dismiss the importance of that, but surely it is a huge buffer relative to if they were to use foreign savings to lend and to spend, given the risk of sudden stops from foreign lenders, which um, uh, is not immediately uh, the same from domestic lenders. And certainly relative to using the credit and debt for consumption, spending it on refrigerators and flat screen TVs, rather than actually saving, which means you have to use it for investment, which at least in some areas have to be return earning uh, investments. In addition, and here again, China specific, the vast government ownership of land and other assets, as well as the very broad contingent claim on resources under the current political system does contribute enormously to the government's credit and therefore credibility. So these two points suggest to me that China does have more time and more buffers than the conventional metrics of credit gaps, etc., would suggest. But they also suggest, and I'll come to that, what could trigger a breakdown of that credit and credibility and what needs to be done to sustain credibility. So these are the macro aspects and what it means. Second, policy credibility. While the definition in the book refers rather narrowly to the government's capacity for crisis management and resolution, under this definition, surely, allowing more defaults would imply a loss of credibility. I would again suggest a broader perspective to include the capacity of the government to contain the further buildup of risks, ex ante, <laughs> as well the ability to avoid time inconsistent financial policies, which is no more further doubling of the bets of the investment bet in response to growth slowdowns. So this sort of broader capacity to, uh, to, um, uh, to prevent further buildup of risk, I think that you know, the government has been both highly effective in resolving crisis, as the, as the book uh, posits, but now, as the debt has been rising 
it increasingly needs to add credible efforts to stop further risk taking and contain moral hazard. So this second aspect of policy credibility, I think, is very important. And as, 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 to, as Tom and, uh, of course, Logan and Dan also say, the recent strengthening of financial policies can be seen as government efforts to build credibility for systemic risk containment, although the jury <clears throat> of how this is going to work is still out. Now, what could possibly trigger disruptions to this government credit, and I'll be short on that. Uh, the authors highlight sort of a potential run on the liabilities of, this, of institutions, um, which of course is true, which combined with a delayed or limited government response poses a key risk. Now, the key question of course is when would a run happen and when can the government no longer stop it? And this is the sort of million dollar questions, how serious is the near term risk in China? What could trigger a crisis? In a narrow sense, as argued in the book, it's the increased complexity of the system and multiple links and feedbacks through the real estate sector, particularly that pose an increasing risk of a snowball effect in the system. But more broadly, again, I would come back to the more macro points I made earlier. And the key question for me really is what could break the government's credit? that is in the market, in the public's belief in the fiscal capacity of the government to backstop the system in case of need. And there are two aspects to this. One is the fiscal sustainability, which is still quite good, and there's significant room. Although, of course, there is a clear policy implication to improve the fiscal quasi-fiscal situation. But there could also be other major shocks to government credibility. And they could be from within the system, political breakdowns, uh, or from without the system, external conflict, and um, and you know it's not our expertise, but I see uh, uh, also, of course, a risk that the government's credit and credibility could break down because of that. Briefly, um, what needs to be done? Uh, the book is so good in what it does that I'm really looking forward to volume two. In <coughs> in similar detail, what can be done actually, and this is. What we are frankly scratching our heads with all the time at the fund, and I'm sure Tom as well and others, you look at our Article 4 this year and the 2017 Financial Sector Assessment Program, the FSUP, we have worked a lot on that, and you'll find a lot of detail on how we think this needs to be done. There's both a big picture aspect and a very detailed recommendations. On the big picture, again, I would come back to to the macro aspects, you, the four points I would emphasize. First, you need to gradually reduce the buildup of debt in the corporate sector, in the household sector, in the government. When you do that, that's adjustment, that's growth subtracting largely. And therefore, you need to at the same time shift to new growth engines, both on the supply side and on the demand side. On the supply side, we have this whole issue of shifting from public to private investment, innovation, etc., and the shift towards more consumption, uh, the whole issue of financial sector reform to make credit more efficient, and I think one needs to also accept, emphasize that, accept lower growth. And here again, I would just say, you know, f when I started China, it was around eight or eight and a half, uh, just three or four years before that, it was 10 and 12 and 13. I don't think ever, anybody would have ever thought it would be around six now. I predict that in a couple of years, you know, we'll be talking about five or four, and I think um, China can handle that as well. On the particular side, you know, in our FSUP and in our Article 4, we have sort of 25 very specific recommendations on how to fix the problem in the financial sector. Let me just, to come to a quick close, mention four of those, uh, which we think, uh, I think are the most important. First, you need to increase capital in the financial system. You need to increase cap bank capital, and I think you can do this. You have a lot of uh, fiscal resources to actually do that. Most of the financial system still is owned by the public sector. Second, you need to increase the autonomy and the resources of the central bank and of the regulators. They're totally under-resourced and underpowered. Third, you need to continue to push the look-through principle of financial regulation. Don't look at the nominal name and re situation of what banks are doing, or financial si uh, system is doing. Look at what they are doing in reality and require capital, liquidity, and other regulatory compliance accordingly. And then last, most 
difficult, and we haven't solved that problem, to be honest. You need to gradually and carefully lift the moral hazard and the implicit guarantees in the system. You know, so we've tried to push our teams into developing a very clear roadmap on how you can actually do that. It's very difficult to lift moral hazard from a system that's pervaded by it. But it, in my view, it's not impossible. First of all, we need to remember not the whole system is more, has a moral hazard. China has a long history of private business, private credit extension, private defaults, private debt resolution. And third, you will not ever remove moral hazard completely from the system. The state in China is continue to play a large role. Public investment, public enterprises will continue to play a large role and will, uh, will be there. So it is, a, it is not a impossible, but it's a very complicated task that needs to be still tackled. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcus, uh, uh, Stephanie, and Tom for uh, extremely helpful comments. Um, they put a lot on the table uh, for all of us to think about. I, it's probably it would be impossible for Logan and Dan to, to address everything that they, they mentioned um, and still leave time uh, before we need to turn out the lights for bed tonight, uh, let alone uh, at 1130. Um, but maybe if I could give uh, Logan Dan a, a couple minutes just to respond to to a few of the points that that were made, uh, and then we'll turn things to the audience. Yeah, th thank you very much to the uh, to the panelists, and uh, I agree with most of uh, what they were saying, including some of the objections and, and thoughts about uh, some of the problems with the report, which we're very familiar with. Make a few observations, especially related, I think, uh, tying off very clearly to Marcus's last point about moral hazard and the, the difficulties of, of breaking it. Um, the joke I always used to use as this financial system was growing was that in China, moral hazard wasn't a problem, it was a strategy. Um, the entire idea and the way the financial system could continue to grow was because there was always an assumption that someone else within the government would be on the hook. Therefore, uh, risk calculus, risk um, awareness within the financial system was extremely low. What was most important was obtaining uh, a claim on some institution that looked like it had a government guarantee. And obviously, that is exactly what has facilitated the rapid growth of the system and needs to change. One of the key insights that we try to offer within the report is that there is this fundamental tension between financial reform and the credibility of the system as it currently exists, not necessarily as it will exist in the future, exactly as Marcus discusses in terms of the broader macro drivers of credibility and the broader policy drivers of credibility. So that's, that's just one observation. Um, on the uh, I, I think it's very notable in terms of the discussion of China's fiscal space. Um, this is often argued as China has a very low level of government debt at this point, therefore they could always expand that level of government debt to solve any problems within the domestic financial system. One of the arguments within the report that we do discuss and, and I would urge you to think about is that that level, that decision to have a very low level of government debt has been a deliberate one. It has certain consequences. Uh, first, it does reinforce credibility because you could always use the central government's balance sheet in the future. But it also makes the current problem more difficult to finance, which is exactly why you have most of China's debt, the difference between China and most other heavily indebted system uh, economies is the interest rate. Most of the debt is, con is held in corporate form which means that it's held at a higher interest rate and needs to be refinanced and serviced uh, with sort of an implicit subsidy to the financial system in that respect um, at higher than what, you, what the government could fund by itself by just going to the bond market directly. So in many ways, that is a policy choice to have fiscal space and it has certain consequences. Um, similarly, just you know, one last uh, in commenting on Tom's point about how China has been actually capable of relieving financial stress. I totally agree. I, I, we would argue that the supply side structural reform agenda, um, the shantytown redevelopment program have been very successful in isolating certain problems <clears throat> within China's financial system and therefore responding to those in ways that ex essentially extend them or you know make them less immediately uh, pressing. But 
those also have consequences. And one of the reports we like, uh, one of the arguments we may like to make in the report is that isolating and finding every problem within the Chinese financial system doesn't just solve the risk, it actually creates new risks. And in this case, the supply side structural reform agenda, for example, has ended up creating new pressures on local government financing conditions because they are often downstream users of the same sorts of heavy industrial commodities that are now seeing higher prices. And so therefore, the productivity of their own investments and their ability to continue to sustain uh, economic growth is weaker as a result. In a macro sense, it's very hard to disaggregate these effects, but I agree with the general point that Beijing can find certain problems uh, isolate them and has been successful in, in, in managing some of those. Uh, Scott, if I can, let me just offer two very, I'll try to be very brief comments. And again, my gratitude and thanks um, uh, to the panelists, fantastic group of people we have here. One, observ one small observation and one bigger one. Um, those listed companies that Tom and Bloomberg are able to track, right? listed to be uh, using the capital markets to finance the growth of the country. If the capital markets were working to do that, then we wouldn't have this bank-dominated morass of uh, liability that has had to be used to grow the country because the capital markets and the fiscal system weren't providing a kind of normal way forward. Um, looked like something magical had been discovered that offered an alternative to all the challenges of global development we've seen, it's going to turn out ultimately that it wasn't really an alternative. It was maybe a costlier way to finance growth today that's going to make it more headwinds probably in the future. Um, and um, to that point, too, Logan and I very much, while we're, we are trying to be brave and describe the ways in which this can end, fire or ice, if you will, right? Um, we're not suggesting that crisis is the only outcome at all, and very much agree with Marcus, Tom, and Stephanie that China has options here. There are assets that can be sold off in a crisis. That's how markets work. You go for the brass ring, you miss it, okay, but you got to sell off a little bit of the family China um, as a result, right? So there are ways forward that don't entail you know, complete meltdown, but nobody is arguing, including on this panel, that the China that comes out the other end of that policy solution to the situation today is the same China that we have presently, either in the quantity of growth or the quality and state uh, 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 direction of that growth on the other side of that reform process. And that's very important, I think, for us to think about as we design our policy choices here around what kind of China we're, they're, they're going to be crafted to deal with two, three, four, five years, not much more than that, uh, into the future. Terrific. I got to uh, tell you all, I am exhibiting a great deal of self-control because I can't tell you how many questions I want to ask right now uh, that are prompted by the report and by uh, the comments uh, from the panelists. So, but I am, I am going to uh, not engage in moral hazard and just start spewing questions. I am going to uh, turn things over to the audience now. So we have a great group here. Um, and I want to uh, give everyone an opportunity to uh, offer questions. We've got a microphone that will come to you. Please wait for that microphone. Uh, and if you could identify yourself and keep your uh, question to a question, that, that would be terrific. So who'd like to start things off? Yes, right there. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Yuval Weber from Daniel Morgan Graduate School here in D.C. Um, so I, I work on international security in Russia, so I'm very much a tourist in this room. So let me ask a really uh, simple and ignorant question here. Um, this has been a discussion more or less about Chinese domestic economy. But the reason I came here is I was interested in um, the Belt and Road Initiative and sort of Chinese foreign economic policy. Will this – so those are – so that's a big program that helps China uh, expand, but those are domestic companies. So does BRI and this sort of expansive foreign economic policy, does it exacerbate the moral hazard and credibility issues that you're raising, or does it provide an outlet to alleviate domestic pressure? So for, for Dr. Ryder, whomever else. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would simply say that uh, we today, when we talk about Belt and Road, and we, we look at what China is saying it is, 
it is being explicitly stated that this is a different kind of development model that has different priorities and sequencing for how you get development going. And we would simply observe that what until recently was described as, you know, a cost effective way of growing China's economy, it may be premature to truly describe it that way, even with the special um, ability within China to reach out to assets, to discipline the way this gets worked out, the still the ultimate cost of financing growth the way China has is not clearly advisable, let alone when you try to export that development model to countries that have much, much, much weaker institutional conditions. So I doubt the fund is ready to endorse uh, Chinese-style uh, investment-led growth as the panacea for 65 or 75 other developing countries around the world. Um, so I would just put it, put it, put it at that, I guess. <laughs> Provocatively to my good friend Marcus. Go ahead. If you've actually been asked by China to, um, to be with them on the BRI, and we have mounted a fairly large effort, including a big conference earlier this year in China, to assess it. So what's our view in a nutshell? I would say two things. First, it makes obvious sense to have a country that has huge excess savings, that have large capacity to mount big infrastructure projects on one hand, and you have countries where there is a major savings gap, there is huge infrastructure needs. So in theory, it's great to connect these things and to make it, make it work. So there's an obvious need and a potential benefit there. If this is done well, it will lead to greater connectivity, some investment needs are being filled, growth and connectivity will, will rise. So I think we need to recognize the benefits of that uh, from an economic sense. There's, of course, political aspects too. By the same token, um, major risks both for China and for partner countries. For China, the ones risks are obvious. You have risks of major resource misallocation, white elephant projects that produce nothing other than wasted resources for China. You have a potential reputational problem that China will go to these countries only use Chinese labor, China's, uh, China's, uh, China enterprises. Um, and, uh, and for recipient countries, of course, again, resource waste huge accumulation of debts that may not be able to be, be repaid. Uh, the whole issue of having investment uh, environments and governance situations that are not able to handle large investment projects coming from outside, particularly without major debt problems, without exacerbating governance problems, corruption issues. So huge risks. and. And how, how, how best to manage these risks, you know, I think is, is, is in a way obvious as well. You need to make sure that you have adequate public resource management systems in the countries, that you have transparency of procurement and uh, project design. You need to uh, probably also be realistic because we have a few institutions in China, for example, that have tried to, to do this. We have the AIIB who has the mandate to do exactly that. And they, from the very beginning, have been very careful in having very high standards for all of these things that I have me uh, mentioned. And as a result, frankly, their growth has been measured. You know, they're in the two to three, four billion range. They're not in the 100, 200 billion range because you probably simply can't do that. So, um, you know, this advice that we have given to them privately as well as publicly at the conference has fallen sort of on mixed grounds initially. It is a signature initiative of the government, and uh, you know some of, of, of the, the initiative doesn't want to hear the potential problems and the policy implications. There is other voices in China who worry about the resource costs, about the uh, other risks that I have mentioned, who have been very receptive to the advice. And I think now, given the experience in some of those countries that you all know that have been in the news recently, there is a kind of a rethink beginning in China as well on how to carry on with that and how to perhaps make it more manageable and, 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 and incorporate some of these standards that we all expect from large infrastructure projects that have always everywhere their risks. Super, super. Rene, right here. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I'm David Lynch with The Washington Post. Uh, 
I'm just wondering about the link between the current confrontation between the U.S. and China and some of the issues you've raised here. If the current trade war becomes something more than just a short-term commercial conflict and becomes an effort to more permanently disentangle these two economies, how does that, to what extent does that aggravate some of the issues you've raised? Does it make, uh, does it give the Chinese leaders more of an incentive to move quickly? Does it raise the danger of a crisis? Uh, what's your assessment? Um, such a complex question needs a lot of time, actually, to unpack. But you know, make no mistake, what we're saying is that the internal level of stress is higher than generally uh, understood, and that the level of resilience is somewhat lower than it used to be, at least, right? And therefore, add to that stress on the external side and that's a, you know, just that much more um, significant today than it would have been a few years ago. So um, uh, certainly um, the, um, the tensions U.S.-China presently um, come at a difficult time. They'll be even more difficult ne next year, the year after, and the year after, because this is just going to continue to get more stressful until it gets resolved and, and worked out. That said, the principal source of strain and stress on the Chinese economy is not coming from Washington presently. That would be a misunderstanding to think that that is the primary concern that Chinese leadership has. Their primary source of trouble is homegrown, um, and it needs to be home resolved. Um, and it will um, be ultimately the wellspring of how the rest of the world um, views China and its, um, its interaction in the decades to come. Hi, Gene Lee, uh, Macro Investing. Um, I thought you're, well, first I'm a fan of CSIS, so thank you very much for the wonderful work. Um, just in terms of uh, Beijing's strong credibility as being a financial stabilizer, I thought that was brilliant. Um, when we started this year, we had financial markets and financial participants being very bullish on China, Chinese economic growth and the markets, especially in the backdrop of strong global growth and uh, China's MSCI inclusion. However, the recent underperformance of the Shanghai Exchange, especially after it broke 3,000, is that a sign of the local investors testing and losing faith in Beijing's credibility? Because it's not foreigners selling it. The second part I would like to ask you is, I, when I just returned from China, I just asked them what would happen if real estate prices would drop 5%, 10%, or 15%, and everyone looked at me and said, it's impossible. I was surprised. Is that a function of the government's strong control of land policy, or is that due to its um, due to everyone's belief in this credibility? Thank you. Right. Uh, great questions on on the the equity markets. Um, we would argue that it's primarily because of it. I wouldn't argue that it's necessarily local investors suddenly. Uh, losing faith in Beijing's credibility when it comes to the Chinese equity market. Uh, the equity market in China has long been a retail-dominated market, and it's long been a momentum and speculative-dominated market. Speculating, speculative not in a pejorative sense, but because you don't have a lot of fundamental investors or relative value investors um, active therein, so you have a lot of momentum chasing. So I think that has been still a primary force rather than a fundamental change in how uh, investors view Beijing's credibility. The market has always been sort of policy and liquidity driven, and it's now in a down cycle. We would argue because credit is slowing so sharply, uh, the sea change in credit creation that we described and the consequent uh, impact on, on corporate uh, positioning. Um, on corporate investment and uh, additional and and the impact on earnings at the same time. So it may be a local development, and I don't really think there's much of an impact from foreign investors per se. Uh, but I don't necessarily think it changed it's changed that much over the course of this year in terms of the equity market. On real estate, I, I have heard si very similar remarks over the years from many Chinese real estate investors who are convinced that the market can never uh, decline. Uh, over time, obviously, uh, that sort of belief has a very long um, has a very long history and is often disappointed in the end. But at the same time, Chinese in the last 20 years, China's property market has had really only three corrections, which lasted for only six to nine months. So one understands exactly where that belief uh, comes from and why property has long been, you know, a key uh, a key asset class for uh, Chinese households. 
we would argue that the change in credit conditions is more likely to have an impact on uh, the property sector in particular because property developers were historically very significant borrowers from the shadow banking system. And so as they lose access to finance, and there are some signs that that is occurring, uh, it's probably more likely that you'll see additional supply on the market uh, while investment-oriented demand uh, probably softens over time. That being said, data associated with the Chinese property market is often quite conflicting, and it's very difficult to get an accurate picture uh, of what's happening. That's still true right now. Okay. Um, yes. Hello, Rob Westcott, Keybridge Research. Um, a data question for you. Um, McKinsey Global Institute came out with a study this summer on corporate debt, and they said they estimated that corporate debt in China was 163% of GDP, I think. And they also estimated that about a quarter of that was issued by zombie firms. Mm. So if you do that math, that would say about 40% of GDP, or the corporate debt issued by zombie firms is 40% of GDP. And I was just curious, is that the right order of magnitude of the, of the debt problem with, by zombie firms in China? Definitely, definitely a Logan Wright question. Yeah. <laughs> um, First, I, would, I, I think the, the estimates of corporate debt in, in, in aggregate very similar to where uh, the IMF has been, which I believe the last GFSR, the Global Financial Stability Report, had that at about 165 uh, percent of GDP, so it seems consistent with those levels. As for how much has been issued by zombie companies, obviously it's a, those zombies in 26, 2015, exactly for the reasons Tom cited, are not necessarily zombies in 2017 based on uh, the change in commodity prices, precisely because they have seen some relief in terms of their debt service. Uh, you know, we try not to separate out um, the quote unquote bad debt component from the aggregate debt uh, situation precisely because it, it's very difficult to define that, de define exactly what's a non-performing asset or what's a zombie firm in China. For example, if for years most of the loans in China's system, over half of them were less than one year in duration, that makes very little sense in an investment-driven economy because you would assume that projects would need to be financed with some degree of uh, maturity match relative to the underlying uh, relative to the underlying investment, but that was nonetheless the case. Why? Because state-owned enterprises had relative confidence that they should borrow at shorter in shorter term so that they could just keep rolling over uh, the existing assets. So which part of those, uh, of those loans is necessarily non-performing? Uh, it's a very difficult question to ask. We tend to look at it more in the aggregate um, rather than, I would say, with any confidence uh, saying that uh, saying that a quarter of corporate debt is is issued by zombie firms, I wouldn't necessarily quibble with that estimate if I was put a gun to my head and asked to make one. Um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of the the more problematic aspects of China's credit and investment boom have been not even in formal lending to uh, state-owned companies. It, it's occurred through more speculative uh, lending into the shadow banking system as a whole. And the property sector and local government financing vehicles just rolling over existing debt, we think, is still a big part of that. Whether that's what McKinsey is classifying as zombies or not, I'm not sure. Just to pick up briefly on, on some of the points Logan made. Uh, I think the question uh, is, are you a cyclical zombie or are you a structural zombie? Okay. Um, and uh, it turns out that there are lots of people at down points in the cycle, lots of firms at down points in the cycle that look like structural zombies, but actually when the cycle picks up, it turns out they were just cyclical zombies. Uh, so when you do that calculation in 2014, 2015, you get a very high number. Um, not quite 40 percent based on our based on our calculations but you get a, a pretty significant number uh, for debt issued by zombie firms when you do the same calculation in 2016 when the industrial sector has exited deflation you get a much lower a much lower number um, we're, we're just about at the end of the time but I want to uh, see if I can ask a question which kind of tries to bring some some of these things together um, which has to do with this tension, uh, not just in China, but in general, between structural issues and cyclical 
uh, to follow on what, what Tom ju just said, because there is issues about the system and, can this, and sort of our, our fundamental views about how systems are meant to operate and how um, they're not meant to operate in this question of convergence of, of systems or divergence. Mm -hmm. And then there's the issue of, you know, you got to have an economy that grows and you've got to have the levers of growth and, and things over time because uh, just simply the slowdown in growth is, is consequential, not just the changes of system. I want to just sort of ask in, in that vein about this relationship between credibility and crisis. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there is an implicit view given China's current system of how credibility is provided, that a crisis w is detrimental uh, and a killer to the credibility because you're not able to control, right? But if China had a different type of uh, system of credibility in which it wasn't just the state's responsibility to uh, intervene, uh, but there was responsibility on the part of the market actors uh, and accountability uh, of market actors uh, as a structural requirement, a standard expectation, um, I could see under those two circumstances the importance, of the consequences of a crisis being different. Um, I think a, a couple years ago we had Andy Xie here, uh, and and you know in his mind he said you know he hopes there's a crisis because a crisis would be cleansing and clarify. Uh, who's responsible and sort of reset appropriately uh, the moral hazard issue. But that certainly has to only be okay in a situation in which the government has credibly shifted credibility uh, to others. Um, are there any circumstances in which um, a, a crisis or you know a, a, a you know a worsening of financial circumstances in the short term could be beneficial and a, and a help be part of the solution? Or is the goal always to avoid the crisis at no matter what cost? I, I think that's a great question and absolutely at the heart of this issue. Um, in following the Chinese financial system for, uh, you know, professionally for over a decade, I've often tried to ask, um, you know, many uh, Chinese officials and, um, you know, other professionals within the financial system of, do you want a another Giddick event or do you want to avoid another Giddick event at all tight, at all cost? And what Giddick means in that context is the Guangdong Investment Trust, uh, International Trust Investment Corporation was a very notable default on external liabilities uh, in 1999. And it actually caused temporarily um, a sovereign downgrade of uh, you know of China overall, and it was generally perceived as a failure. But that is exactly sort of the question that Scott is asking, which is, do you want to see some episode of financial stress that is clearly deliberate and a change in uh, signposts so as to reset uh, expectations effectively? And there's never really been a great answer to that question over time, which suggests that you know these are these are difficult in terms of how much financial risk can you allow. Uh, without endangering uh, the system as a whole. Um, me and other uh, analysts in, in Beijing at that time, we always used to say, you need a medium-sized crisis. Um, you can't have a large crisis which overwhelms the state of the, capa the, the capacity of the state to respond. You can't have a small crisis that just gets basically covered up and uh, swept under the rug in just uh, two to three days, which many of China's um, intermediate, there have been many episodes of financial stress in the report. We referenced not only the interbank market crisis of 2013, which I think is a very significant event, but also the Sealand Securities scandal uh, with entrusted bonds in late 2016, which was a pivotal moment in terms of reinforcing uh, Beijing's capacity to respond. So, you know, it's not necessarily the case that crisis is always detrimental in that context. And one of the one of the arguments we make in the report is that. You know, the distribution, there, there's an extensive literature in banking, political economy of banking. Um, a book that's cited in the report is uh, by Calamaris and Haber called Fragile by Design, where they talk about there's a non-random distribution of banking crises in the world. These are often reflecting different political institutional arrangements that either facilitate um, additional instability or try to control it. And the ability to basically favor stability over efficiency has been a long-standing Chinese political decision, whether um, intentionally or unintentionally, as, as it has evolved. 
I, I, I th completely agree with what Logan says. Just to, I think we'll need a series of mini crises as we have had. We have had a mini exchange rate crisis in 2015 that has lifted us from a peg where everything was guaranteed in the exchange markets to a different situation where now the markets are much more used to two, three, four, five percent, you know, range. We have had a ca mini capital account crisis where, you know, uh, we have had the interbank. I would posit that even the interbank crisis of 2013 and the recent default crisis of in 2016 have brought the system further, both in the expectations of investors, certainly in the, um, uh, in the attitude of regulators, and the, and the whole system is has advanced. Now, the trick is that, you, you, as everybody said, you can't do this for the whole system at home. You have to design a system where you compartmentalize and localize. Maybe you look for a few provinces where you solve the state enterprise system more radically. Maybe you look for another system of the, the bond market where you, or parts of the bond market, where you start to reduce moral hazard. I, I think China can find a way, given that I believe they have more time than we think. I think this is a five to 10 year enterprise. And critical, the biggest risk, I think, and coming back to what, what David Lynch said, Xi's paradigm of shifting f towards high quality growth from this investment led quantity growth, I think is at a critical stage because it is starting to run into its own headwinds. Financial adjustment is slowing growth, is creating many crises here and there. And this is now being compounded by external shocks, exit from easy interest rate policies globally, emerging market stresses in Turkey and Argentina, and the trade dispute. So this is really a, a, a sort of a, I wouldn't call it a Lehman moment, but it's, it's, it's a critical moment. What does the government do? Is it going to retreat back to business as usual and throw out the reform strategy? Can it handle these twin stresses? I think the way how they have moved so far is in part promising. I would think I would see them continuing with the flexibility on the exchange rate. I see them continuing with the financial adjustment. But I think the jury is still out. If that continues a few more months or a year or two, how can China handle this slowdown that comes from its own reforms, compounded by the much more difficult external situation that is here and is probably likely to be even worse at some point in the future when very high growth in the US will, will, will slow down? Scott, uh, to offer a thought on this, you know, I think one of the organizing principles very popular, including in Washington right now, is that the problem with China is that it has not tried to reform over the past five years, that it stopped trying. But per Marcus's point, actually, there have been repeated, repeated many crises mm. over the past half decade mm. because they have tried to find a way forward that still accommodates their unique conditions, including their politi political conditions. So an equity market crisis, an interbank crisis, a renminbi internationalization crisis, uh, a fiscal crisis at the local level mm -hmm. as well, on top of the structural mm -hmm. crises, environmental and otherwise, that they're having to deal with. And now they're dealing with the shock of an external pressure getting tweaked up mm -hmm. um, as well. So yeah. in fact, this is a country that keeps trying <laughs> but is not finding a magic way forward because the conditions that made it easier in the past, demographic dividend, uh, starting with such a low capitalization mm -hmm. situation, those are done. Things have changed. We're in a more normal set of conditions now than we were 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. And so to your question, do crises work? Mm -hmm. They work if they are quality crises, mm -hmm. which means after the crisis, your potential growth is greater than it was before the crisis. But if your way of handling that crisis is to try to stabilize things the way they used to be halfway through the adjustment process, then actually your potential growth afterwards is lower than it was when you started. And that is, at the end of the day, the conundrum that Beijing faces presently. Well, we certainly understand this conundrum a lot better uh, because of the report um, and I congratulate you and Logan for your tremendous work. I also want to thank uh, Stephanie, Tom, and Marcus for offering their uh, critical insights today uh, for everyone's participation. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Dan Logan and the entire panel.
you can find the report uh, online. Uh, there also is going to be a podcast, uh, which we recorded this morning, available in the next couple days. And they've also written a short commentary, uh, which we will also issue uh, later this week. Uh, and um, uh, hope you will consume all of those items uh, and uh, welcome your feedback. Um, anyway, have a uh, great rest of the day. Thank you.